And this is Powerful Stuff. Wellness Education Cannabis Advocates of Nevada present the Weekend 702 Nevada Cannabis News Hour with the Weekend Radio Team. For the next 60 minutes, we'll take an in-depth look at the cannabis reform revolution sweeping the nation. Now, let's fire up the news hour. Here is the Weekend Radio Team. Welcome to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, today, we have our host, uh, Michael McCullough. Perry Haichu, myself, Kurt Dukach, and in the studio today we have the guests Rihanna Durrett and Amanda Connor. So, uh, so Rihanna, you're with uh, the Nevada Dispensary Association, correct? That's right, and okay. I'm also an attorney um, working with Amanda Connor. Okay, and uh, just recently we had a, a remote satellite office open up out here in Las Vegas to help us with patients obtaining their medical cards. So, and you were behind that, correct? So can you tell us a little more about it? That's right. Um, the Nevada Dispensary Association worked with the state going back to the beginning of this year and a little earlier to address the delays that uh, patients were experiencing in obtaining cards. I'm sure you guys are very familiar with the delays. Um, it, it seemed to take, anecdotally, two to three months to get a card. and sometimes longer. Some patients, even with terminal illnesses, were waiting um, months, which obviously doesn't um, serve any purpose to anybody. So the state was actually really uh, receptive to NDA's involvement and, um, and allowed and worked with us through meetings and um, different briefs that we submitted looking at what is the problem, how do we address the problem, and uh, they they actually came with, up with the idea, well, let's have this office in Las Vegas where that patients can walk into. Why not go to the patients? So we still have the Carson City option of applying um, through the Carson City office, and that's really important because that process is being sped up due to a lot of efforts of um, of NDA and other um, organizations. And, and also the fact that the department is awash with money from people who, uh, who put in licensing applications. So they now have the budget to do these things. Um, I actually, um, I don't know how, how much they've received based on the cards, though that those figures are out there. Um, either way, it was something that needed to happen that there, there were fixes that could be made that didn't even cost money. Mm -hmm. So uh, we really focus on can, those. Can you give us examples? Uh, one of the best examples is um, they would deliver um, the applications to uh, another department that would do background checks, mm -hmm. um, hand deliver them, wait for then wait a week, go pick them up, bring them back to the office, and um, wait till they got those results to issue a card. And we showed them. Um, I, this was a legal argument that I presented to them that NRS doesn't require you to wait for these background check results. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, issue the card. NRS allows you to issue the card. If you get the results and it shows that the person has a conviction that does not allow them to have a card, go ahead and revoke the card. And so that was a fix that didn't require money. Well, because uh, since the program's inception, and certainly as we've we've seen uh, in personal experience uh, over the past ten years, uh, once you do submit your application, you get a preliminary letter back from the state saying that your application has been conditionally approved, uh, pending uh, the results of this, and that your um, uh, that your permanent uh, approval will come through at some point after that. But unfortunately, it seems that in the, uh, the language of the law, uh, dispensaries were not able to work on that, um, on that approval letter that you had to wait for the physical card. And you're nodding your head, Amanda. What, <laughs> what do you think about this? Oh, well, I, in working with NDA, uh, my law office, one of the things we argued is that um, since we represent many of the dispensaries, they should be allowed to accept the conditional letter of approval um, in the interim while um, the patient's background and card is being issued. Because another hurdle that they still face is you go to the DMV to actually get your card, right? Mm -hmm. You get your letter, you are actually can't go purchase yet. You still have to go to the DMV oh. to get your uh, 
to get your card. So it has made, there has been a change. Another one that I don't think costs the division any money is that they now allow patients with their letter of approval to purchase up to 60 days pending obtaining their final card. Mm -hmm. um, and then like Rihanna was talking about, now that letter of approval comes even faster because they'll issue it without receiving the background check and then they can revoke it if the background check raises an issue. And, and you're absolutely right uh, where uh, you're talking about a 60-day process and, and Rihanna you were talking about it could take two to three months. Um, back in, in 2010 um, when I had a, re a referral service um, uh, the, the division was taking three, four, sometimes five months to get uh, answers back to these people and if somebody is sick if somebody had diabetes and they had to wait for five months they'd be dead uh, if somebody has a terminal illness they can't wait for that amount of time and um, you know I, what I'm curious about uh, you're talking about expediting this uh, for um, uh, you mentioned terminal patients and I think that's been one of the biggest issues that we have had for years uh, is that if you've got somebody who is that sick not only do they not have the time to wait but they're not going to necessarily be able to go down to the Department of Motor Vehicles and physically get a card, much less go to a dispensary. Now, in theory, with the, de the delivery services that dispensaries offer, that could be ameliorated. But uh, the idea that you have to have the card when you have an official letter that, that came mm -hmm. certified from the state uh, seemed kind of right. nuts. So there are some short-term solutions in the works for work for that and then there's some long-term solutions that I'm sure you guys would support and and uh, there will be room for everybody to be active on this next session. Um, first short-term short-term solutions are that the entire process will be electronic. And these are the these are the fixes that did take a lot of money and effort from the state. A lot of um, they had to really use use up their resources for these and luckily they are so the entire process will be electronic and ultimately there will be no DMV visit required so that is already in the works um, we expected that to that hap that to happen already the um, process going electronic they're in testing mode for that still and well, I, I think they've, they've gotten it so now that you can make your original request for your application packet That's online. Correct. Yeah. So you will also be able to upload it um, electronically, and then you will receive an electronic letter of approval. Cuts down on the time greatly. Usually. And ultimately, no DMV visit will be required because the DMV and the Department of Public and Behavioral Health are working on developing the software to um, be able to do a, uh, the electronic magical internet communication to allow uh, the DMV to issue your card from the DMV without you coming in using your driver's license picture. So the long-term solutions are, uh, I think we, any, anybody in the industry and any um, patient advocate would know we just need better access. You know, this was this was an entirely new program. We had, the legislature was very careful implementing it and and that's probably fortunate for everybody, even though it's very frustrating because um, we did it the right way, and we didn't have um, any any huge problems with anybody getting sick. So, going forward, though, we know this needs to be treated like medicine. You need to take down the barriers between a doctor and a patient, and uh, and we need to allow people to obtain their medicine as soon as their doctor okays it. We'll still have other controls for tracking, but we need to not have so many steps in between where the government is involved in um, in, in facilitating that relationship. Mm -hmm. It should be between the doctor and the patient. Very good. Well, I have a question uh, please. for our viewers. What exactly is the NDA, the Nevada Dispensary Association? What is your, what is your purpose? Are you a lobbying group for the patients? Are you a trade organization for the dispensaries? And if so, how many, uh, what percentage of the dispensaries do you represent? Our, we are a trade organization that represents dispensaries. Those are the members. Um, we represent their interests and advocate for their interests in any way that a trade organization would. And the idea was for, originally was for these um, dispensary owners to get together and say, um, how do we make this industry a success and and how do we go forward with best practices that will benefit everybody we need we need to be self-regulating because this we don't want to invite trouble 
So that's uh, the way it was founded. Um, we have been very active in industry advocacy, which many of those issues do benefit the patient who are central to the industry. And uh, right now we represent about 40 of the 66 dispensary licenses, and many of those dispensary owners also have cultivation and production licenses. So um, it is primarily focused on license holders, but as you guys know, this is a small town and everybody knows everybody, so um, these, um, these owners are very conscientious of patient issues and making sure that we keep the patients happy as well and well served. Uh, Amanda. Um as as, um, as Rihanna just said, the state was very careful uh, in exact in parsing out exactly what they were going to allow and what they were going to allow. And the division has uh, not stepped one inch over the line of of where um, uh, of what this what the legislature said. Uh, they're not willing to put toes any further in the water. Um, the complex. Uh, nature of the regulation that we have, while certainly is good for attorneys, uh, you know, and, and you've, you've done a lot of work in this area, um, is it really maybe too much? Uh, on the one hand, it seems uh, in talking to a number of licensed applicants that uh, over the last couple of years that it was almost an insurmountable mountain of paperwork that they had to deliver, yet on the other hand, um, when you're looking from a federal perspective, the more strictly regulated a state program is indicates that the state is occupying the field there and not giving the room for the federal government to uh, to step in. So where do you feel this uh, all this regulation has come from? So I feel Nevada stepped in initially uh, to be very heavily regulated um, for the exact reason that you indicated that the federal government said if a state is regulating its market, we're not going to step in, although it is still a Schedule I uh, drug. Um, I think right now Nevada is trying to figure out how to strike the balance between being regulated and yet um, ensuring that patients have access. Um, you know, as an attorney, you're right. I, I like regulations. I also like black and white. I want it, yes, you can do this, or no, you cannot. And unfortunately, we don't have all those answers because it's such a new industry and a lot of things weren't anticipated. And so the division is working hard to kind of strike a balance between um, patient access and businesses being able to kind of self-regulate versus making sure it's uh, regulated and they have uh, good oversight. Um, the other thing that I try and tell people is this was passed as medical marijuana. It is a medicine. If you think the paperwork that was submitted to get a dispensary or cultivation here was difficult, try going through an FDA food uh, drug trial. Mm -hmm. That paperwork is a lot complex and, and in, in essence we're treating this as a regulated drug under the same kind of scheme and complex. So I think that it, Nevada was, tr you know, yes, it's a lot, but Nevada was trying to regulate it in a safe manner for patients. So as a um, representative of the Nevada Dispensary Association as, and as someone who has uh, plenty of clients in that area, um, I know that any industry uh, tends to say, oh my God, there's too much government regulation and if we just have less regulation, business could be easier, prices could be cheaper and it'd be better for everybody. Um, are you hearing uh, complaints from any of these MME holders at this point which who, who are saying, gee, th this burden of what we have to do the state is just too heavy? I think there, there could always be some regulations that in hindsight go a little too far. It's, it doesn't seem to be the framework of the regulations, um, but how they're enforced that can sometimes, sometimes be a problem. But in general, I I think that the dispensary owners, um, that's not their primary concern because they do want it to be a well-regulated industry. And these, and this really sets Nevada apart, these are business, uh, successful business leaders and community leaders have, who have been compliant in another field already. Because we had the, um, because we had the requirements we did to get involved in it, you have doctors who are used to following regulations. You have lawyers who are used to being regulated. You have um, successful business owners who are used to being regulated. So 
whereas there might be some complaints here and there. Overall, I think that they understand the need for um, to, to for Nevada to succeed. That we want to run a tight ship here. Well, it's interesting that doc, you're right. Doctors and attorneys um, uh, are used to dealing with complex regulations, uh, but I'd say most of the chief growing officers of these uh, industries are not. <laughs> and um, you, so it it seems that in a lot of these cases that you have people who got these licenses, and you make this point exactly. Uh, they they went through this process, they, they were well versed in it, and yet they largely were inexperienced in this industry yeah, a lot beforehand. Of cannabis people owning cannabis yeah. dispensaries. Um, do you do you smoke cannabis? Um I I I'm not going to share that information in a public <laughs> um, medium, but well, I, that's a closeted you know, yes. <laughs> I don't think that I, I I wasn't aware that that was going to be an issue. No, it's not, it, and it's, it's not. not. It's not particular. What I'm trying to say is that it seems like there's a lot of non-cannabis people that are in the cannabis industry. And my question is, you know, did you have any prior experience in the cannabis industry before representing the dispensary association? And that's that's like a lot of. I guess due to the overburdensome regulations, we did have a lot of business leaders and basically people who had no interest in the industry before getting into it, in my opinion, mostly for the money. And, uh, you know, there's a cop that owns the uh, apothecary shop up on West Buffalo. And, you know, I do what I can to throw them under the bus every chance I get because I feel like uh, people who have spent their lives trying to subvert the industry really have no place in the industry. And, you know, maybe that's a very childish way to look at it. but. You know, it is what it is, and I take a very uh, aggressive stance on that. And uh, I, I just wish that there were more, I guess, what I would want to call an honest representation of a, a true cannabis entrepreneur and not just someone who decided up just to gather their, their wealthy friends and just open a dispensary when there were so... Look, if, I wouldn't have a problem with it if it was an open thing, if anyone was able... like, And when I mean anyone, I guess anyone really can because you can gather a team and go ahead and apply. But really, when you get right down to it, it's not possible for most normal people, average middle class people, to open a dispensary. And it's uh, or even uh, a mom and pop bake shop. There's no such thing in this yeah. state anymore uh, when it comes to the cannabis industry. Well, and if there were a lot of unlimited numbers of licenses given, it wouldn't be a big deal. But when there are so few restricted licenses given and they're so profitable, it seems a shame that. Uh, that it's gone that way, but you know it is what it is, and that's another story for another day. And, and that's a complex statement. We're going to give you a little time to respond. We'll, we'll go to our first commercial break now, and we'll talk about that a little when we come back. Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. Attention medical marijuana patients. Did you know that your medicine could contain pesticides, heavy metals, and even mold? Are you really sure that you're getting the same potency every single time? Well, the answer to that question is simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a state-approved laboratory run by scientists. So look for the Digipath Labs quality seal on your next medicine and on the door of your favorite dispensary. 
To learn more, go to digipathlabs.com. That's D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Hi, I'm Armin Yemenijin, CEO of Essence Dispensaries, and I'd like to let you know a little bit about our company. As a completely complimentary service, our on-site nurse is here to meet with any patient or non-patient to discuss dosing and best practices. We have three convenient locations. We have one location on Tropicana between Decatur and Jones, which is our west side location. Our Henderson location is on the corner of Sunset and Green Valley Parkway, and we're proud to announce that we have the first and only dispensary on the Las Vegas Strip, on the corner of Las Vegas Boulevard and Sahara. Our prices are the lowest prices in town and the highest quality medicine. Please come and see us at one of our three convenient locations or visit us at EssenceVegas.com. You can also call us at 702-978-7575. Once again, the number is 702-978-7575. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Today in the studio, we have our guests, Rihanna Durrett and Amanda Connor. So, uh, we were just talking about the uh, the state remote office and uh, some other items here. Uh, well, and, and just before we went to break, um, Perry was saying that uh, he felt that the regulations uh, were such uh, that it prevented a lot of small businesses from getting into, small potential business owners and entrepreneurs from getting into this business, and that you had a lot of um, people who were uh, non-cannabis or even opposed to, to uh, medical cannabis or cannabis usage beforehand all of a sudden jumping on board. Um, it's been my own uh, assertion that the state in regulating this has uh, chosen to, you know, it, it, it's pot, not plutonium, that they've gone way overboard on this. And, um, you know, I agree that if this is medicine, and we're legitimately uh, calling it and using it as medicine, uh, that quality controls need to be put in place and that um, we need to be uh, careful to make sure that the patients have uh, something which is not contaminated by pesticides, which is not contaminated by mold or other pathogens. Uh, And so there's certainly a need for testing in the labs. But, you know, being a lawyer aside, or being lawyers aside, do you really think that, um, that, we need this much regulation going forward? Or do you see that there's a possibility we'll streamline the process? Well, in my opinion, I think it, it's striking a balance. I think we will streamline the process um, some, and they'll be um, perhaps a little easier to get in the industry or remain in the industry once you're um, up and operating. But I also think that we'll find other areas where there isn't a lot of regulation that they will then come in and start regulating more heavily. Um, it w- I recently was out talking with legislators and local um, people from the city of Denver, and they were talking about how they kind of went on this roller coaster ride of, you know, higher regulation and then wanting to loosen it up, and then there would be another problem or issue that arose, so they went to stricter regulations and then back down. I think we'll ride that roller coaster ride here for a little bit in Nevada till we can kind of find a balance between having a regulated market but also allowing businesses to operate and patients to have access to medicine. I, I would very much like to see when we're going to get to that low point on the coaster because uh, I, you're, you're talking about Denver and I remember going back into Denver uh, in 2009 and opening a dispensary and cultivation and all I had to do was go down to City Hall and pay 20 bucks and get a business license and I was in business. Sounds and, good to me. You know, and, <laughs> and so it, for, for people who have had that kind of uh, uh, entry level experience, uh, it does seem that this whole process is hugely complex. But, you know, as, as you're saying, Rihanna, uh, where we'll be looking into the lex- next legislative session, and just because this is uh, encoded into statute does not mean it's immutable and unchangeable. There, there's every opportunity for people to get involved in this process, make their feelings whole. And that's one of the things that, that I do love about Nevada is that we are so close in access to our legislators uh, because they're part-timers in this, bec- uh, because they are so available uh, in their home districts so much. Uh, I think that it gives uh, anyone who's interested uh, the opportunity to reach out to them and, and tell personal stories and start changing minds. And um, I just hope that, that that outweighs the checks from big pharmaceutical that they wave around during session. Well, 
I think that uh, I don't I don't think that's been uh, a big concern, but this is where patients really need to weigh in because I I was under the impression that there are a lot of patients who want rigorous testing and want to know the exactly the, what the product is and want to know mm -hmm. the terpenoid Absolutely. profile. So <laughs> I think a lot of those questions come from patients. So I would uh, I'm I'm very interested and I don't have the answer to know. What what exactly do the patients want to know about the product, and so and so how much should be required by the state to answer their questions? I, I don't know that um, that I would completely agree with that because um, uh, when you're talking about patients uh, interested in terpenoid levels and 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 the mix up of cannabinoids, uh, people can get their blood test results back from a doctor uh, from a lab, and they are not going to know the least bit about it, and only a small percentage of them is actually going to. Um, uh, uh, going to go online or investigate it, and it seems that they're just um, that in the in the case of medical cannabis that they just want to know what's going to work for them, what the potential side effect would be, uh, and that it's clean. Yeah. Oh, so the tests that are required now are pesticides, um, terpenoids, cannabinoids, growth. Regulators is when they're considering adding herbicides, fungicides. Mm -hmm. So I would love to know from the patient's perspective, which are those that you think the state should require and which ones oh. are, patients want, are not They the want it cheap concern. and they yeah. want it strong. They want it, that's it. I, I think the, the average patient out there is they're going to look for the THC content, which is basically telling us the strength, the CBD content, which is the strength on that. And, you know, basically we want to make sure that it's safe, that it doesn't have mold or mildew or pesticides on it. All the other stuff is just kind of like, you know, icing on the cake. And whereas I would say a majority of the patients don't even look at that stuff. They, they don't. look at the oh. THC, the CBD. and Yeah, that's it. They're looking know. at the THC content, some of them the CBD content, and mostly the price. All of this other stuff is just for the regulators and, and the legislators. None of that matters to them. And, and this is all for show, basically. I mean, it, it really is just as simple as that. And uh, Kirk, we were speaking over the weekend, uh, uh, counseling someone who had just joined the, the program, uh, and this woman was afraid of taking something that had too high of a THC level. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. it seems that the benchmark that all these dispensaries are competing against one another uh, and the cultivators is, oh, we have the highest THC, but that's just one of 66 ca cannabinoids in cannabis. And, you know, if what you're doing is looking to get high and euphoric, then THC is the thing that you want. But otherwise, there are CBD and CBN and so many other things really come into play. And I, I think if you're if you're end of life, if, you're, if you've got cancer, uh, there's nothing wrong with that euphoria and you want to go there. But just to use THC as a benchmark um, really takes away from, from the Look, plethora. That, I, that I, understand, I understand what you're talking about, but I'm, if I'm a dispensary owner, most likely I'm here to make money. Even mm -hmm. though they say, oh, we're here for the patients, like, it's about making money, straight up. Well, for me and my shareholders. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, sure. But... Oh. Uh, Look, <laughs> it's just, I'm not gonna, No, I, I agree with you, and, and in all honesty, and, and let me get your opinions, it seems to me, although we have a medical cannabis industry, that looking at most of these places as they've developed, that um, they all seem to have developed and opened with the recreational market in mind. I, I don't think any of the people who spent all this money uh, were saying to themselves, okay, well, we're going to have this little medical marijuana market, and so that justifies spending millions and millions of dollars. Uh, well, well, I will tell you that uh, I know the state and several of the p business owners based it off Colorado's numbers mm -hmm. and the projected patient numbers that Colorado got. If Nevada had followed that track, there would have been a, a, a booming medical market that they would have recouped their mm -hmm. initial investments rather quickly. Um, Unfortunately, because of some hurdles that we were talking about earlier with getting patient cards, those numbers in Nevada have not increased as was projected. Um, we expected to see, you know, 60 to 80,000 in the first year in Nevada once dispensaries opened, wow. and we're at mm -hmm. under 20. Yeah. Um, so, so um, you know, there's there's been some hurdles, but I think people did look at thinking they would have a robust uh, medical market here in Nevada that even if recreational didn't pass, 
um, because a lot of the, t uh, the recreational initiative wasn't officially on the ballot or considered by the legislature at the time they were applying. Um, so they, they, they inis initially invested looking at the medical market. Well, as, as the person who actually authored that uh, report to the Senate Judiciary Committee and, and provided those numbers and, and used Colorado as our example as another Intermountain West state, uh, one of the things that I said in that report was those numbers were going to go up significantly to the numbers you're mentioning once dispensaries were open. And that didn't mean once Euphoria opened the first dispensary in August of last year. Uh, we've we really didn't get to that point of that general availability uh, until just I'd a say, few months ago. yeah, just a few months ago, earlier yeah. this year. Yeah. So I, I'd say the jury is still out on that. Is it possible yeah. that we could achieve those numbers? We're behind the curve in doing so, but everything that we can do that makes it easier. Pardon me? I said not with the restrictions of getting the card. Well, I, so think, I think that's yeah. what the, the, the dispensary association and these are trying to alleviate that. Because in Colorado, it's super easy to get. I, I, think, I think we've approached a lot of the hurdles, and we've done a good job knocking a lot of them down. But I still think we have one humongous hurdle that really puts us at a disadvantage is the price. I mean, we've done wonders. I mean, it's come down. But still, even now, even to do it yourself and not, not go through any of the services, you're still looking at $200 every year to get your card. Whereas you go to California, you walk in $40, you walk out, you got your card in your hand. So that's one of the that's one of the biggest hurdles that we still have. I mean, that's a lot of money, and that's part of the reason we have our patient program. We have patients every day reaching out to us saying we can't afford to get our medical marijuana card. Which you is know, one I'm reason on why we can now. has a uh, has a patient support program for indigent patients uh, and we've helped uh, I don't know how many but it's a over sizable number over 200 patients who could not otherwise afford to get their cards uh, we can has covered that cost for them and I think w that's one of the things we need to look at next session and that we can partner on again as well as other issues is re reducing or eliminating that cost for example and and I'm, I'm not saying this is going to be what we would propose but for example if we propose that once the um, patient has their doctor's recommendation they take that straight to the dispensary something like that there is no cost for the card mm -hmm. um, something along those lines that's more of a California uh, viewpoint right yeah. and you know there's many other factors to be looked at but I do think we need to look at the cost it shouldn't it, it, it is prohibitively expensive for some so. and it should be noted that before the change in 2013 the cost of the patients annually was $200 uh, or no no not $50 and then $150 for the uh, for the the license annually uh, and that that has has been cut in half so so they are doing things to, to help the patients um, one thing I'd like to ask you guys about uh, is um, I, I know that you're can I go back to yeah, I just sure. want to mention yeah, yeah. That, um, that uh, I, I don't think Perry and I will ever see eye to eye on this but I have had conversations with owners that are very heartfelt they are very connected to the patients. I have one particular one in mind who was in tears because she was having a difficult time helping a cancer patient get the card. She physically drove the patient to to obtain the card, and there's just so many stories of. Um, you know, I have a friend with a with a child. Yeah, with yeah. Seizures, Every, everyone so. has great stories after the bill was passed and after all the hard work was done. Everyone magically has these great stories to tell. All of a sudden, they're big big supporters. All of a sudden, uh, oh. if this is true, I'd like to see them do some real philanthropic work like I've done in legislative session next year. Tell the dispensary owners to pass the bill to, to, so that we can have concealed weapons permits. Fix the DUI bill. If you really care about patients, then fix the patients' issues. Well, and there are definitely opportunities to work on these, and you, and, and you are part of an organization that has a voice in that matter. Yeah, and, yeah, and yeah. Let, let me ask, um, you had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, we were talking about terminal patients and the like, and just before airtime, I learned that one of our um, uh, local district court judges, whom I won't name out of, out of respect for her privacy, uh, has just entered hospice, and um, that we were approached in how can we help this person, how can we help get her medication. Now, if you have someone who's in hospice, yes, they have a doctor who will likely sign off, but how can they or will they be able to have a family member or a surrogate go into this uh, office on West Sahara and um, and actually get 
state approval so that they can be treated the same day because w once they're in hospice they don't typically have a lot of time. medical power of a I, I think there would be some hurdles to jump but I do think that's possible the caregiver would be able to and a, a mobile notary yeah. or you know and this is something that the dispensaries have been enlisted in helping because of the delays it's to so that they can um, help patients figure out this application process because it unfortunately isn't as simple as it should be so i do think yes she will that that is possible there will be some hurdles and of course i'm happy to help with those and 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 there are others happy to help with those but yes she will be able to become a patient well and and that's i mean doing it in such a timely manner uh is especially important for people who have a, a very limited amount of time uh, so it, it it it's good to hear you saying this I'm, I don't think that we gave out the address of this facility and also are, are patients able to or prospective patients able to go to these this facility directly or do they have to go to a dispensary first and are referred please you do need to go to one of the dispensaries that are uh, that participating, are participating yeah. and and that is not to bring patients into the dispensaries. If, if a patient is getting a card, they're going into the dispensary. It right. wasn't to attract patients. It was to have the dispensaries um, help the state with reviewing these applications for completeness and accuracy because mm -hmm. they were getting applications that weren't complete and accurate would have to mail them back. It was causing a log jam. So they said, okay, we will provide this satellite office to help you. You need to help us pro kind of process the applications. They're, they're not processing them, but they're reviewing them to make sure they're complete. So they've been trained to do that now mm -hmm. and they're providing staff to do that. Uh, you'll need to go to the NDA website and I can Which provide is? that. www.nv dispense.com there's a list of participating dispensaries go in there there should be somebody there who's designated to walk you through the process and schedule an appointment for you to get the letter of approval the same day that you submit it they'll schedule the appointment you'll walk in and get it approved and how many uh, dispensaries out of the 40 members that you have uh, are participating in this program uh, there are approximately 12 uh, dispensaries participating some of them have several dispensaries so I'd say there's probably uh, off the top of my head 15 is, is there a, a hurdle that, that prevents everybody else from just getting involved in this so you had to be trained by the state on the application process and how to review it for completeness and what items they're specifically looking for the idea was that if a dispensary pre-screens it a staff member who's been appropriately trained then those who are actually going into this application office will most likely have complete applications and therefore the application be can be processed in a timely manner and not have the law Log jams or delays like we experience at the DMV where people walk in and oh I didn't know I needed this piece of paper or I didn't know that if you have someone that's walked you through it and you know exactly what to walk in for with the hope is in 15 to 20 minutes you are walking out with your letter of approval so uh, that would be ideal so you're saying then that um, that the reason more dispensaries are not taking part of this is because they have not uh, designated people to be trained in the state process yeah a good number of them are involved mm -hmm. um, the ones that haven't maybe they just um, haven't um, didn't have the time because they're working on you know getting operational to be involved a, a good number are involved and, and you, you don't need to be a member of NDA to be involved and as much as we can expand ex, expand this program I'm happy to do that if we could have we can helping with patient applications and scheduling appointments I would be happy to do that um, the state uh, kept it small because it's a pilot program so seeing how it works and hopefully it's my hope as as proud and happy as I am with the office it's my hope we won't need it because everything will be electronic and no DMV visit will be required and I have to mention that Amanda has been through this uh, there every step of the way in this process and has been really helpful in it as well and Amanda let me let me just ask going to the uh, you know going to the next legislature uh, there are um, there are plenty of plans and ideas that people have uh, but everything is waiting on this vote in uh, in November which every poll that I've seen shows it polling at a minimum 56 percent and up to 60 percent um, presuming that those numbers hold and it does pass what do you think that means for the legislative process vis-a-vis -vis the the medical cannabis industry mm. so the Question two, should it pass, will not 
directly affect the medical industry. It will stay exactly the same as it is um, today. But I think the legislature will have quite a few questions that they should address. Perry brought one up a little earlier, um, saying if the dispensaries really care about the patients, they should address the DUI and concealed carry um, issues. I think that the legislature, regardless of whether question two passes or not, they need to look at some of those issues. But especially if question two passes, we, we need to define how we're going to identify DUI and prosecute it, um, how we're going to handle um, banking issues, how we're going to handle uh, patients and concealed weapons, because we know Metro has, has taken a stance on that and said you can't get your concealed weapons permit. Is that a state law or is that just a Metro thing? That's a Metro policy. That's good to now. know. I like based that. I need to talk to you after law. this. Yeah. It is yeah. based on the state law, but that is a formal uh, and Metro policy. There are patients in other counties that are applying and obtaining concealed weapons. That's permits. what I've heard. I've heard my county is not so restrictive with that. And, you know, that's never prevented me from getting my hunting tags by being a medical marijuana patient. So the state will take my money in reference to guns in one hand, but deny me from spending the money on the, on the gun, on the gun, something that involves firearms on the other hand. So, you know, apparently the Department of Wildlife doesn't matter or doesn't care. So it's just one of those things. Yeah, there, there are issues like that that I think definitely need to be addressed by the legislature, um, making, uh, you know, making sure that we have safe product in the stores, but yet looking at how can we make it more affordable to patients. And right now, Rihanna was listing all the testing that's required, um, and, and all of that is comes through statute. Um, but there may be some, especially if we can get feedback from the patients, that may not be required and may be quite costly. Um, that, that we can reduce or eliminate. Well, great. Yeah. And, and it's about time for us to go to our second break, so I want to thank our two <laughs> guests. <laughs> uh, this, is not, this is not a cross examination <laughs> or even a direct examination. But we want to thank Rihanna yes. Durrett of the Nevada Dispensary Association, and we want to thank Amanda Connor of Connor & Connor uh, for coming down and sharing this valuable information yes. with us today. Thank you so much, counselors, and thank you for dealing with me. Well, <laughs> thank you. We have issues that overlap, and so the, I think uh, once we need to get together and work on those issues together, and then you can just continue to. Well, keep the me entire on other Republican issues. Party doesn't <laughs> doesn't agree on things, and we're going to see that next week. And the and nor does the Democratic Party. And so it's it's the nature in in anything where you have more than a couple of people that there will be disagreements. So uh, we'll see where it goes. I appreciate you having us on today. Yeah. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you for your time. Thank you, and we'll be right back. Attention medical marijuana patients. Do you know what your cannabis actually contains? Are there heavy metals, pesticides, or even mold? And what strength is it really? And is it really what you need? Well, the answers to these questions are simple. Digipath Labs. Digipath Labs is a Nevada state approved medical marijuana testing facility whose scientists carefully test products for safety and potency all within the state's rigorous mandate. You can buy with confidence and trust knowing Digipath Labs has tested your medicine. If you're a licensed grower, dispenser, extractor, or edibles manufacturer in Nevada and want unparalleled customer service and consumer confidence, go to digipathlabs.com and find out what we can do for you. And as a patient, only go to dispensaries that carry the Digipath Labs seal of approval. That's digipathlabs.com, D-I-G-I-P-A-T-H labs.com. Or call us at 702-209-2429. That's 702-209-2429. From the soothing sounds of a water wall to the warmth, wood interior, and beautiful artwork, as soon as you enter Sahara Wellness, you are welcomed into a relaxing space where we strive to provide our patients with a healthy balance of mind, body, and spirit. That balance is achieved through a compassionate and knowledgeable staff who possesses both a passion for the medical cannabis industry as well as unrivaled dedication to assisting those in need of a natural method of pain relief. Our bud tenders are available to assist patients in selecting cannabis-based medicine that best suits their needs from our selection of flour, waxes, CBD lotions, and delicious edibles. Sahara Wellness is located at 420 East Sahara Avenue, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out our entire menu at www.420sahara.com. 
Nevada Pure is a premier vertically integrated medical marijuana enterprise which offers top quality medical marijuana, great customer service, and a safe private environment. We carry a wide selection of medical cannabis strains. Our knowledgeable staff will insist you in finding the correct strain for your condition. Our trained professional staff can educate you on various strains for your condition, methods of consumption, responsible cannabis use, and the wellness benefits of cannabis. We aim to help patients achieve a better quality of life. Medical marijuana is a medicine, not an intoxicant. It's about a patient's well-being at Nevada Pure. From the moment you make an appointment with us, your care, health, and well-being is our priority. Nevada Pure is located at 4360 Boulder Highway, Las Vegas, Nevada. Check out their entire menu at www.nevadapure.com. Getting Legal offers an informative and simple way for you to get your marijuana card. Why come to Getting Legal to get your marijuana card? We have a 99% approval rating and the lowest price in town. Avoid legal problems. Getting Legal can get you legal fast. Ready for a new start? Come in now and get relief from your chronic conditions affecting your quality of life. Call Getting Legal today at 702-979-9999. That's 702-979-9999. Or visit our website at gettinglegal.com to get your marijuana card today. Ah. Welcome back to the Nevada Cannabis News Hour. Uh, today, right now, we have joining in us uh, the Hope Studio our president and founder, Jennifer Solis. Woo woo! So. Thank you for gracing us with your presence. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, it's much nicer here than working all the time. But uh, so I'm I'm happy to be back, even just for the short time with you guys um, in this welcome atmosphere. Um, I was worried about you guys earlier. I don't know about the Democratic Party or the Republican Party, but my party's pretty fun. <laughs> <laughs> you always throw such fun parties. Well, I was going to say, speaking of fun parties, you know, we're coming into, we're coming into this, our eighth year anniversary and that party coming up. When's that? Um, that's going to be, what, the 28th? August yeah, 28th? yeah. Well, we're, this month is our eight year anniversary, July. So uh, normally we throw a July party, but this this last time we had so much stuff going on that we've we've kind of bumped it into august so we're going to be doing it on august 28th that's a sunday so and it's at a new property no none no one's ever done anything here before and it's a three acre property with an olympic size swimming pool or solar salt heated water. salt water outdoor bathroom so it's a it's 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 on the line of the property phenomenal in boulder city phenomenal. you're not going to want to miss this one yeah, as exactly. usual Mm -hmm. And as a, with a saltwater pool, we can br we can invite the attorneys and the dispensary owners in because it'd be uh, amenable to sharks. <laughs> <laughs> I was gonna say, you know what? I think that you have a future, uh, Perry, as a as a as a junior Ralston man. <laughs> oh, absolutely. absolutely. Well, nobody wants him around anymore either. They, <laughs> well, no, that's just Sheldon throw, Adelson. Yeah, they've thrown did. him yeah, under yeah. the bus so far. <laughs> Good God. Well, I was gonna say, I think that with that had to do a lot to do with Sheldon. Adelson, you know, he came back with a PBS, didn't he, Ralston? He's one of their largest yes. donators. So, yeah, yeah, and so and, and so, <laughs> Alvin Adelson was a PBS's donator. So. Well, you, you know, it is what it is, and that's that's journalism in America these days. And I'm not going to get into that with Ralston too far, but you know, I'm sorry uh, if I came across too abrasive. But really, I have great passion not for you know people accuse uh, certain people of not you know of uh, having ulterior motives and things like that. And you know, uh, regardless of what people think, I'm a fairly philanthropic individual in my in my. Uh, in my nature on this you know i really do care about the patients and i feel like they have kind of been left behind in all this and um it, it's and important to patients, refocus but the the people who have uh who have been helping these patients for years and um what we really need to see is a a program uh by which those who were convicted on a state level uh at, at the very least uh will have those convictions expunged i would love to that see would that be a, that would, that would be, be great, amazing that would be a great start too and i you know what and going into this eighth year i think that it's uh, that it's fully possible for we can to to really do that uh because now we have a northern nevada chapter that's right. Yes, newly created. Um, tell, welcome. tell us about that. Yes. We have a Northern Nevada chapter that not only has activists, it has lawyers, it has uh, lobbyists on it. It has a radio show. Radio show. So 
Wow, right? So this makes the third weekend chapter now, right? The third. Yeah, yeah, we've got Pahrump, we've got Weekend 702, and we've also got Weekend 775 now. So you can check out our social media and get the links uh, in to that. And so that's new and exciting. Very exciting. Um, we've also um, made new positions on our board. Um, and and Michael's been welcomed back as a director. You know, mm -hmm. he was he was here for the longest time and helped form our organization, and we're happy to have him back. Um, Perry's going to be taking care of uh, like events and event management and coordinating that. I trust him wholeheartedly. Kurt's going to be doing secretarial work and, and getting all, making sure that all of our stuff is filed on time. Stacy's still our treasurer. Mm -hmm. um, Perry was at, I mean, um, uh, and Ramsey you are was still our Madam room. President. Oh yes, Indeed. and I'm still the Which president. Which is really important. And of yep. course, Jason's still the Vice President. Still VP. Mm -hmm. So um, we're moving on. We're moving upward, and we're expanding, and to to bring our message to all of Nevada, and also to expand our programs to all of Nevada. So that's super important, and I'm and I'm happy to be a part of it. I would I would. Go ahead, Kurt. And we added a couple new advisory positions, and we're adding a veterans chair also. Oh, that's true. And we still that's have uh, Dr. Drew Fu as our medical medical director on, on our board, and yep. Bruce Gale is our legal director. Mm -hmm. That's true. So, so yeah. our team just gets bigger and bigger. And uh, and, uh, and when you mention Bruce Gale, he's a, he is running for a district court judge position, and um, without we know endorsing our anyone. Cannabis. But you know, I think that anyone who has been a friend of this industry. Uh, deserves whatever support we can get them. Definitely, no definitely. doubt, absolutely. You know, uh, and that goes back to what you were saying a little bit earlier. I would like to touch on one national story before we go, uh, and that it's that um, the Democratic Party has endorsed marijuana legalization for the first time, and. Um, uh, uh, this really has a lot to do with uh, Bernie Sanders staying in the race against Hillary Clinton uh, when uh. it was almost impossible for him to get the nomination. And even after she had secured enough votes that she was assured the nomination, uh, Bernie uh, refused to concede. And there were all sorts of calls saying, you know, for him to get out, get out. But the reason he didn't was because the Democratic uh, platform committee met and he was able to have his supporters uh, get a number of different issues uh, in front of this committee and move forward. And the one that of course uh, we are interested in is that the uh, the new text of, of this is that um, because of conflicting laws concerning marijuana, both on the federal and state levels, we encourage the federal government to remove marijuana from its list of class one substan control substances, providing a reasoned pathway for legalization. And that's, that's what Bernie, Bernie's group wanted to get. What they actually wound up getting was something that, that didn't say to remove it completely, but to look at, at rescheduling um, with uh, an eye towards legalization. And they actually are, the Democratic Party is calling for marijuana legalization as part of its platform. Now, let me just say one word, though, about, um, b uh, about platforms and platform planks before we get into this, uh, is that they're non-binding. Uh, in 2010, Jen and I worked together to get a platform plank in the state Democratic Party uh, yeah. to yes. uh, support and encourage the development of a legitimate uh, medical marijuana industry. And um, it got adopted into the platform and then just got ignored. It fizzled well, out. Hey, so. yeah, on the other side of that, I have okay. a story from the uh, Republicans Against Marijuana Prohibition out of Texas All right. that said that medical marijuana failed to make the GOP platform after vigorous debate. So while the Democrats are opening the door to full recreational marijuana in their platform, the Republicans slammed the door shut on even medical marijuana as a full party platform because as one delegate argued, all people who commit mass murders are all smoking pot. And things of that nature, and this is straight from Cleveland. Um, I think just actually, like mass meat this, murder on Cheetos. Yeah, this no, is the nonsense say. that we still deal with. Yeah. On a policy level, yeah. the attempt at clarification may have swayed some votes. Wyoming Senator John Barrasau, chair of the platform committee, couldn't determine at the first attempt whether the measure was passed by voice vote. The proposal was voted down on the second vote, however, and it's just that's it was constant. Like 
And, and even on this Democratic one, uh, that, that vote th that put By this one. language in there was, uh, was 81 to 80. In oh, favor. my God. So, no, I mean, yeah, just barely. that you know, close. And you know who introduced that platform into that? That was our friend uh, Christine Kramer. Mm -hmm. who was uh, he recently here with Steve Ross and works yes. with him and that. So she's uh, been a friend of ours for a while. We've had her yep. on the show probably a year and a half ago. Yep. And, yep. Uh, yeah, she's the one who introduced that and wow. passed by one. But then the hemp bill failed. <laughs> that is <laughs> ludicrous. That is strange. <laughs> it's like... Yeah, it's but still. Insane. So, so as as a proud Republican, Perry, how how do you feel about the party uh, that you support uh, uh, to take this kind of uninformed It's horrible. Stance? It's absolutely horrible. It alienates young voters. It it not only spits in the face of the democratic process, considering a disproportionate amount of people want this, but it puts their own people in the closet. I'm not going to name names, but there are a lot of people on my Facebook page that work for the party who smoke cannabis, who will not, cannot, and are terrified to tell people about it because they'll lose their job, they'll lose their place in the party, they will be outcast, and, and they, our, they feel it's a shame because they will proudly carry that banner into battle, but get shot down because of it, because yes. of something that they don't sit well with. And it's a lot of religious dogma that's involved in it. It's, uh, it's a lot of, uh, it, it's, it's terrible. I mean, I could go into it for days really, but um, I think it's absolutely anti, it's against everything that the Republican Party supposedly stands for. Small government, staying out of people's business, self-responsibility, self self but yet they can't wait to stick their nose in your business as soon as it has to do with pot or sex or a couple of other silly things that they really feel that they want control over your life with. Yeah. And uh, they, they back up employee drug testing, which is ridiculous. I, I mean, I could go into it for days, but really, uh, it's alienating well, a lot of young Republicans. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's okay. alienating a lot of young Republicans or a lot of young social or a lot of young fiscal conservatives mm -hmm. so from it's, joining it's, that. So it's joining basically, that it's just it's it's degrading the party. I yep. think it's by far the, the party's doing a good job of degrading itself, it's and true. they're uh, no, they're so. just continuing to stoke those fires of hate. I don't understand. And, yeah. and what you're doing is you're describing uh, the typical libertarian party member who is fiscally conservative but socially, socially liberal, socially progressive. Ab yes. Absolutely, absolutely. Oh. And if we can get something to say that we have open primaries to where libertarians can vote in the primary, I would love to register as one. Oh. But uh, as long as that exists, it's going to be difficult for me. It's going to be difficult for me to, to register as a libertarian. It just is what it is. I was going to say the Libertarian Party is now in Nevada. It's, seen, it's, it's moving in the right direction. But about, what, three, four years ago? I when think it's more like six years ago. Maybe Are you six talking years when ago? we went to the yeah, Libertarian we, Party convention? It, it, yeah. was, it was divided and it, it was backbiting and infighting and all sorts of non nonsense that I wouldn't, I was like, really? The Libertarian and Party? Kind of what's going on with the Democrats but, and the Republicans. But the now? thing is, is that now the Libertarian <laughs> Party has kind of moved past that. But you're right about the open primaries. Um, you know, isn't there a chance that Bernie Sanders may run on the green? No, he no. came. He came out no. publicly today and endorsed yeah, Hillary. So yeah, it's, oh. it's done and it's over. So, um, you know, yeah, I, we, oh, and that hurts. I, I think that this this election bust, right? is going to be a choice of the lesser of two evils. <laughs> like most evils. And always, yeah. It's, <laughs> well, people said anyone but Hillary. Congratulations. <laughs> yeah, sure. You got what you wanted. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, I, th I think we're. it's about time for yep. us to wrap this up yep. now. Yep. So all right. I want you guys to take a look at all of our social media and our Facebook. Make sure that you're out there at the party to see yes, me please. and visit They're me. Fun. I, I need They're hugs. They're great parties. That's I need right. hugs. And, uh, Check out our website, weekend702.org, for a calendar of all of our events. Thank you for having me, guys. Yep. Thank Anytime, you for coming. Madam President. We'll see you next and week. Thank you, guys.